Hello and welcome, I'm Zach Lane from Community Health, bringing you our Unity Through Community video blog, Because Your Health is Our Mission. Today I'm joined by Eleanor Graybach, a licensed clinical social worker at Community Health Rutland, and we'll be discussing psychoeducation, and Eleanor will be going through a brief slideshow talking about sort of our thoughts, actions, feelings, sort of focusing on that mental health there. Eleanor, great to see you. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Do you want to jump right into your slideshow and take over? Okay, um, so I put together um, a little bit of a slide so to just kind of have a visual aid to kind of uh, explaining a little bit of understanding how we think about things, feel things, um, react to things, and so I find that visual kind of aids are helpful for doing that. Um, so I'll kind of go through things that I typically go over with most of my clients within the first session or two. Um, because I think it's really helpful for us to have a framework for understanding, hey, why do I do what I do? And that's uh, frequently a question that uh, clients will have when they come in. Like, I'm doing this stuff, I'm not really understanding why, I like this, I don't like that. And so um, the education part gives us a little bit of a, a way of understanding ourselves in a way that makes sense. And when it's explained seems pretty simple and basic, but it seems to be like, wow, makes a lot of sense once it's presented kind of in a clear way. I start with kind of events. Basically, that just means stuff that happens to us on a day-to-day -day -day basis. You know, we stub our toe, like on a chair, we get stuck in traffic, you know, our coffee's too hot, or our coffee's too cold. Um, stuff happens to us like all the time. And in reaction to stuff that happens to us, we have certain thoughts. So like, hey, how come I can never have my coffee when it's cold? You know, everybody's so busy. I never get to have mine until the last minute and now it's cold, you know? And so based on the thoughts that we have, we have feelings, emotions. Um, so we know pretty much a list of emotions of anxiety, um, depression, anger, sadness, uh, agitation, that kind of goes on the spectrum of different types of emotions. Um, what I encourage people to do is understand their thoughts. So there's a little thought bubble of like, hey, these are the thoughts that we have in our head about things that happen. Emotions, I encourage people to, to kind of get in tune with what's going on in th with their bodies that kind of lets them know that they're having certain emotions. Um, anxiety tends to be this energy of like, hey, something's happening that's freaking me out. I need to get away as fast as I can. So energy is geared towards moving away from something. Um, anger is usually about, hey, stuff's happening that I don't like and I want it to stop. So energy is usually geared towards moving towards something that you're going to make stop because you don't like it. Um, so I kind of encourage people to kind of understand what's going on with their body, what their bodies is part communicating. People usually relate to the one that's hunger, right? Like when I'm hungry, my tummy drop growls because your stomach is saying like, hey, pay attention, you need to feed me. Um, and if we ignore that, more things happen. So, hey, our body's trying to clue us in in the early stages of the game, pay attention so that it doesn't get so big. Um, so that's why we kind of focus on that. And based on what we think and what we feel, we kind of do stuff. Um, so, hey, stub my toe. Why did these people leave this chair in the middle of the room when I told them not to? And we might yell because we're angry, right? So we do something based on, you know, what we think and what we feel. And then there's consequences. So we yell at people, people freak out and run away from us, or people get angry and want to stop us from yelling. So we think things, we feel things, we do stuff things in our environment happen as a result of what we do and it kind of circles around to new events, new thoughts, new feelings, behaviors. So we're just kind of constantly moving through our day accessing what we think, what we feel, and things that we do. So it sounds pretty basic. Um, mm -hmm. I did this in a linear fashion, but we actually know that, you know, they actually interact and affect each other. So it's not really necessarily a linear thing. They all interact with each other and influence the, each other in various ways. So at one point, our thinking bubble might be, you know, this big, our emotional bubble, because we're totally in tune with, you know, our Spock brain, just the facts. So emotion brain might be like a little bit smaller. And we tend to behave in ways that really are aligned with our best interest and goals that we have for ourselves. You know, if the feelings part gets really big, it kind of like hijacks the whole show. Um, so thinking kind of is out the window. Behaviors, we tend to do things, interact with others in ways that really are not in our best interest because we're just functioning off of emotion. Um, so kind of they all play off of each other, different sizes influence how we do things in different ways. Um, so that's kind of that piece. So some thoughts on our thoughts, right? How do we learn to think the way that we think? 
you know, because we're not kind of born with a manual that someone hands us and says, hey, if you live your life this way, based on this manual, everything will turn out great. We kind of start off with a very basic blank life manual. Um, we do know that genetics and kind of our mother's experiences of their pregnancy with us can have some influence on us. Um, but basically from the first day, we're busy kind of taking notes in this little life manual about how the world works, how other people work, um, how we work in relation to all of that stuff. Um, so again, chapters, uh, how does love work? How does work work? How does, how do other people's work, you know? Um, and in the beginning, we really only have emotion, right? So when we're first born. So when we're hungry, does someone feed us? When we're cold, does someone wrap us? When we cry, does someone like snuggle with us? And kind of based on those early experiences, we start to learn about how the world works and what our role is in that. Then come the thoughts. We kind of translate like those into thoughts. Hey, if I cry and no one comforts me, why does no one comfort me? That's a question. And our little brains, because we're when we're small, we want to figure things out. There must be a reason why people just let me cry and don't, you know, snuggle and comfort me. I must not be worth it, right? So that's kind of how we start to kind of develop this framework, this little life manual about what the world works and how we function kind of within it. Um, most of what we learn about the world and kind of these dynamics that go on on a day-to-day -day basis, because it starts with our caregivers, we start to go to school, we might be involved in other communities, a church community, a boys and girls club community, there's all these other factors that start to influence how we understand the world and ourselves. Most of that kind of gets imprinted pretty early before the age of 12. Um, and then it kind of goes into this automatic pilot mode because we're learning so much within that first decade. There's no way that we're going to kind of think every little step of every little thing we do on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis. So our brain does this like quick thing of like automatic pilot. So, hey, you do this more than three or four times, maybe even five or six times, we're going to put it in the automatic pilot pile. Like, so you just do this automatically. You don't have to think about it, shortcut it, boom, we're there. Um, so in some ways, it's really, really useful, you know, in terms of patterns and habits that we kind of get into. Um, there's other times when it's not. So I kind of talk about, you know, so when is automatic pilot not helpful? Um, when we do things automatically without thinking. Um, so when we're not curious, we don't tend to be very flexible or collaborative. Hey, this thing doesn't work for me. Maybe I should do it a little bit differently. If it's an automatic pilot mode and we leave it there, it's just going to keep running, doing its thing the way that it's always kind of doing it. Um, so this is the way it's always been. So this is the way it'll always be. So we're just going to leave it alone and not even think about it. That's when we find things um, that we do that aren't really useful for us tend to be in that file. They're just on repeat without really any kind of thought. Um, and that's kind of creates an environment of rigid thinking, not being curious, just doing the same thing over and over again. I have a lot of clients that will kind of ask, so then what do I start to do about all of this emotion, all of this body stuff? Um, earlier in the slide, I had kind of had that picture of the three circles. Um, when emotion is really, really big, it kind of crowds out the other two. Our ability to kind of think through things and do things that are in our best interest, you know, tends to get reduced when we're really in that like emotional bubble of stuff. So calming the body down, letting the body know like, hey, I hear you, you know, let's try and attack this in a certain, in a different way, um, allows us to access different parts of our brain. Um, so what is it that our body's trying to tell us? Maybe why, if we have the time at that particular moment, if not, again, put it to the side to address at a later time. Um, but basically we wanna learn, you know, how and what is the body trying to tell us so that we can kind of get clued in sooner than later to take steps to calm it down. Um, so one of the things I frequently tell clients is easier to blow out a match than a bonfire. Um, so we still have a flame, but it's small. We can take kind of quick steps to kind of, you know, snuff it out. Bonfire is a lot bigger. We can still put it out, but it takes a lot more energy and resources to do so. So we can kind of clue in to the things that, hey, that matchstick first gets struck. We take steps to kind of, you know, snuff it out much easier than putting out a bonfire. Um, so there's a, um, another therapy uh, kind of approach is dialectical behavioral therapy. And its main focus is on the body and trying to kind of get the body to 
you know, calm down, soothe down. So there's a lot of skills, you know, within that, you know, framework of calming your body down. That's where you have your relaxation strategies, meditation strategies, um, some physical movements that can also help kind of calm the body down. Um, again, so that we can have brain clear, optimized, getting into that problem solving mode where we can kind of clearly see things um, uh, in terms of what's in our best interest. So then we kind of get back to the thinking stuff. If we kind of get the body calmed down, all of a sudden brain gets to kind of come back, thinking brain comes back into the room. Um, and this is where we can use skills that we kind of um, come from the cognitive behavioral therapy kind of framework. Um, assessing if what I'm getting, the messages that I'm receiving um, are actually accurate, that they're happening right here, right now, what's going on. Um, with cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a whole list of cognitive distortions that we can become familiar with. Um, one example would be all or nothing thinking, you know, hey, uh, if um, you're not talking to me, you don't like me. You know, there's probably a lot of gray areas within that, not just all or nothing. Um, so that's one of the cognitive distortions. If you find yourself thinking in those ways, it clues you in that you probably would need to think a little bit more through that um, aspect. Um, so one of the final pieces that I um, tend to go over when we kind of wrap all those pieces together is to really kind of sit back and take a consideration is what is it that I'm really wanting to achieve out of this kind of event and this dynamic that I'm participating in. Um, so kind of what is your end game? Does what you're doing and um, reacting to match what it is you're wanting to kind of achieve? Um, so, hey, uh, an example I kind of go through um, might be um, I'm at the water cooler and Mary Jane walks by me without talking. So that's the event, right? And the initial thought is, ooh, Mary didn't talk to me. What's going on? Oh my gosh, did I do something to get her upset? The emotion is stress, anxiety, you know, hey, something's wrong. That's not okay. So the body starts reacting in those different ways and the behavior might be like, trying to go and over apologize a million times. And Mary Jane is like, I just had to go pee, <laughs> you know? And so here you are, you've like, you know, re created this whole scenario in your mind about why Mary didn't talk to you. Um, and if you're trying to kind of establish friendships and be kind of really, you know, um, easygoing in the workplace, you've kind of just created a lot of stress and a lot of drama that doesn't really quite match the end game. Does that make sense in terms of that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so the final piece that I kind of give is, you know, remembering to kind of take care of ourselves, slow ourselves down, find moments to um, pay attention to those activities that kind of help us reset, you know, recharge, regroup. Um, so that could be things like, you know, doing routine physical exercises because that helps get that energy kind of moving through our body, especially with anxiety and anger that are, you know, kind of movement oriented. Um, exercise helps our body goes, yes, we did something, we ran away, or yes, we kind of got that energy out. Um, social connections are really important. So spending time with people, you know, that um, you care about and that are healthy for you, um, paying attention to your nutrition so your body doesn't get stressed out from eating too much, too little, or the wrong kinds of things. These are all things that can, can help the body kind of keep things more in balance. Um, so I really encourage that piece as well, not just what's in your head, but kind of paying attention and taking care of your body um, so that it can help you be as optimized as possible. Um, so that's uh, kind of a little overview of some of the things that um, we go over in the first few visits um, to just kind of help us understand ourselves and hopefully optimize ourselves um, to kind of handle our stressors in the best possible way. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you again, Eleanor, for coming and talking today. Um, and thank you to everyone for watching this episode of Community Health, you need through community video blog. If you're interested in learning more about our programs and services, check out our website at chcrr.org. Community Health, where your health is our mission.